My name is Julie Bogart. I work with Brave Rider. It's my company that I started in January of 2000. The original intention was to help families find better relationships while they were working on writing at the same time. You know, I was asked recently about how Brave Rider differs from some of the other writing programs out there. I would say that the biggest difference is that I initially saw the writing process as a relationship between trusted allies, the child and the parent. One of the ways to grow a writer isn't simply to work on writing. It's to establish bonds of affection and joy around language. One of the ways that that can happen so naturally that we call it the crack you know, addiction, the gateway drug to Brave Writer is through poetry tea times. Poetry is one of those subjects that every parent feels good if they know their child loves it or likes it or knows how to read it. Sort of like chess. Like you have this, you know, sort of ambiguous relationship with online games, but if your kid spent as much time playing chess, you wouldn't mind. Because chess, you revere. You see it as showing that your child has a good brain. Well, poetry is sort of in that category. If our kids obsessively listen to a favorite band, sometimes we say to ourselves, oh my gosh, I wish they wouldn't listen to so much music. But if you saw your child devouring a book of poetry, I think you would be kind of proud. You might even brag about it to your friends. So today, we're going to look at poetry, we're going to enjoy tea, and if this is something you think your homeschooling or other schooled friends might enjoy, you can share right now. What you wanna do is swipe to the right if you're on an iPhone, or swipe up on an Android, and then hit the share button. And you can share it to Twitter, Facebook, or your other Periscope followers. Let's see. Yes, so many people love Poetry Tea because they are just, just shocked to discover that their children really buy in. So that's wonderful. Also, if you enjoy this broadcast, can you tap the screen and give me hearts? That's a way of creating social proof for all of our other homeschool friends out there who might enjoy being a part of this community. Oh, you're all sharing. You guys are awesome. I wish I could see. I can't read your names, but I appreciate it so much. And the hearts are so pretty, aren't they? Um, you can assign toddlers to this task. They might enjoy it. I think you can give like 500 hearts in two minutes. So, you know, if somebody really wants to knock yourself out. All right, so let's get started, shall we? So what is the origin of Poetry Tea Time and why did I come into this practice? Well, I'll let you know. Back when I was sort of a young homeschooler, I had a posse of children just like you, you know, anywhere from three to five, right? That's, uh, I started homeschooling when I had three kids and then I had five by the time I was done. And um, I wanted them to care about learning. I know that's what you all want. Even people who use textbooks in homeschool, they want their kids to care about learning. I didn't know how to make that happen. I was doing a, a reasonably good job. We had a lot of parties <laughs> and we did a lot of hands-on kinesthetic activities. But my passion is language arts. I love poetry. I love writing. I love everything about language. I like acting. I like watching movies. I love reading books. And I wanted my kids to feel that way about language, this most sacred part of my personhood. So I was on one of these Charlotte Mason homeschool lists and a woman shared about a time that she was doing geography terms with her kids and they did it while they had tea. It was a fairly casual thing, but she just happened to mention that they always liked to have tea when they did like morning time or something. And this got an idea in my head. I thought, well, I love poetry. I love Shakespeare. Maybe that's how I introduced this to my kids. So Johanna at the time was like seven or eight, and she had three very busy brothers and was sort of sandwiched between, and then sort of a baby sister. And I realized she needed some special time with her mom. So I cleared the boys out. This is my very first one. Later they came back, believe me. But we cleared the boys out and Johanna and I decided to have a tea time. We set the table and decorated it. We made little treats 
I guess the thing she remembers is I gave her her own cup of vanilla or lemon yogurt, I think she said. And you know, in a family of seven, no one ever got their own anything. It was always, you know, the big Costco bin that you dumped things out of <laughs> onto plates, right? But for this tea time, I made sure she had her own little lemon yogurt cup, which to this day is still her favorite memory. And we didn't read poetry. We actually read Leon Garfield's Shakespeare stories. I read her A Midsummer Night's Dream. And I can still remember her. She's my very fastidious child. She was so careful, sipping the tea, sitting ladylike, listening to my every word. And you know, it birthed a, li a lifelong love of Shakespeare. Well, once I saw the success with Shakespeare, I knew I couldn't keep the boys out. So I decided to pair poetry with tea time. And to my surprise, they were as into it as Johanna was. In fact, they were more into it. They wanted to make the centerpieces. They liked making the scones or the muffins or the brownies, you know, or even like when we had no time, cinnamon toast. Um, we all took turns reading poems. So what we would do is we would create like a table full of poetry books and everyone would simply open the book and page through looking for a poem to read to the group, even the non-readers. In fact, the non-readers love picking poems. Sometimes they pick them for the illustrations. Sometimes they pick them just because of the shape of the poem on the page. But in all cases, everyone loves being in charge of deciding who has to hear what. And for your non-readers, you can certainly stick them in your lap and read the poem right in front of them. Or you can receive the book and read it in their honor. Make sure you acknowledge that they are the ones who chose it. But the goal is simply to celebrate poetry. It's not to create some kind of, you know, abstract analysis of the poem. We're going to talk about that in a minute. But I wanted to just give you a flavor. So before we start, my teacup's empty. Is yours? I'm going to pour some tea. I invite you to join me. Ready? In fact, this might be a good time to take a screenshot and then you can share the poetry tea time with your Twitter followers. Ready? Here we go. I'm going to pour tea. Screenshot. Click, click, click. You got it? Whoop! I almost went over the top. <laughs> okay, now I'm going to drink it. Ready? Here's my big tea sip. Oh my God, it's still so hot. That's the beauty of the tea cozy. I should get paid for these. These are incredible changed my life, learned about it from my British friends. So how did I first fall in love with tea? I wanna tell you that story because I think it's funny. I was pregnant with Noah, living in Morocco. Some of you know that I spent the first years of my adult life in Morocco and I got pregnant and I intended to have the baby in Morocco. John, my husband and I lived in a town called Meknes and an hour and a half away was a town called Rabat, which is the capital of Morocco. I had a British midwife who lived in Rabat. So once a month, I had to take a trip from McNess to Rabat to have my belly examined, right? When I would go there, my husband would drop me off and he would go to the English bookstore. He was an English professor, so he always wanted to be around good books. I would be dropped off with Anne and she would measure my belly and listen with her little stethoscope. And that was pretty much the whole event. I mean, there was no waiting room. It was in her apartment. I was laying on her table. And when we were done, she, the very first time, she invited me into her kitchen. And she pulled out her tea, PG tips. And she said, would you like a cup of tea? And I looked at her and I said, Anne, I can't drink tea. It has caffeine. I'm pregnant. And she looked at me and I will never forget. She said, oh, Julie, do you really think that British women give up tea just because they're pregnant? <laughs> and I immediately cracked up and she poured me a cup of tea and I was instantly hooked for the rest of my life. I don't drink, I don't smoke, but I spend a lot of money on tea. <laughs> and PG tips are my favorite. Apparently, they sell them at Walmart online. I get mine from a local uh, grocery store that has international foods. You can also buy them through Amazon. They're very ordinary, daily black tea, 
But the nice thing about it is that um, they're better than our Lipton. So if you want a more robust, traditional British flavor, I'm all about PG tips. When we were poor, I drank Lipton. And I, I'm okay with that. <laughs> so do whatever you like. So that's the origin of the idea of tea. But guess what? Poetry tea time doesn't have to be tea. In the winter, we often had hot chocolate. Sometimes we had hot apple cider. Sometimes we had lemonade out on the deck. And in fact, many times, I let my kids decide what they wanted. We had a coffee maker, we had tea, we could have juice. The idea is to elevate the experience. Because here's what's going on, in case you haven't caught on already. When we imbue an experience with sophistication, a little intentionality, some elegance, we instantly associate the context with the subject matter. Suddenly, poetry goes from being just another school subject to an opportunity for enchantment. And that's what we're all about, isn't it, in homeschool? We want to pair rich contextual experiences with our learning objectives. And then our kids will suddenly find that they have precious associations for the rest of their lives. Um, I wanted to read you a couple of quotes about tea, because I like these. Samuel Johnson, who many of you know, he created the first English dictionary. He says, you cannot make tea so fast as I can gulp it down. So the British, as you know, see tea as the panacea for all emotional struggle, for comfort, and for a sense of pleasure. And then the Chinese have a saying that they say, a day without tea is a day without joy. And I concur wholeheartedly. That might make a nice copywork piece. Someone says, did you do poetry tea time every day or once a week? Oh my gosh, there were seasons where we did it every day. Um, someone's asking about my favorite poetry books. We're getting to that. Uh, but mostly it was about once a week. In fact, just so you know, my oldest, uh, I mean, my middle son, Jacob, who is now 24 and uh, in law school, when he was in college at Ohio State, his sophomore year, he was a resident assistant on a dorm floor of all boys. He took teapots with him and poetry books. And he used to have reunions in his dorm room, drinking tea, playing card games, and reading poetry. Boys and girls. Yeah, he was a total chick magnet for sure. But even boys. My daughter, Katrin, she used to bring her public school friends over and they would make poetry tea times in my kitchen. Anytime my kids come home from college or from being out in the world because they're all adults now, I have five kids, 19 through 28. The first thing they do is make tea. They always want to sit down and talk, share about what they're learning. And in fact, our love of language now is so entrenched in our family culture. The kids all send text messages to each other with vocabulary. They've sh traded poems. Three of my adult kids, this blows me away. I only figured this out the other day. Three of my adult kids are on editorial boards for self-generated literary magazines in their peer groups. One of them is Johanna with kids, you know, 20 somethings in New York. One is Liam at St. John's College, and one is Katrin at University of Pittsburgh. I want you to understand that when you cultivate a language rich, rich environment, you are creating a lifetime of passion for the word. And that is different than teaching the paragraph. We all speak in paragraphs. We all speak in sentences. It's not that difficult to help people know where to indent. That is not the goal of writing. The goal of writing is conveying the interior life and having enough vocabulary to give it rich expression. Poetry tea times help with that. And one of the benefits of poetry tea time is that you're so happy. You feel like you're hitting all the bells, right? The academic bell, the feeling good bell, the eye contact and connection bell, the eating quality food bell. I mean, if you can hit all of those together, it's like, Home run, man. You're just sure that it's been a good day. One of my uh, Brave Writer families always says that you can reset the thermostat of the day gone wrong just by having a poetry tea time. 
If everybody's cranky and they hate math and they're poking each other and pulling each other's hair, just say, who wants to help me make muffins? We're having a poetry tea time. I guarantee you, the whole mood changes in your homeschool like that. You can do that for them. All right. There is no right way to do poetry tea time. We have families who have made them uh, out on their back deck in the spring. There's one family who has been with me since the year, I think, 2001. And one of their early poetry tea times, they live up north, like in Minnesota. They made an igloo on their driveway and they filled thermoses full of hot chocolate. And the kids sat out on little stools inside the igloo, reading poetry, drinking hot chocolate. I've seen people use poetry tea time on vacations, in hotel rooms, uh, when they're out, you know, going to Starbucks. You don't have to be home. You don't even have to have a centerpiece, but centerpieces are really fun. One of the things we like to do is I like to send the kids outside before tea time and ask them to collect things that would look good in the center of the table. So we end up with acorns or pine cones or a, a little piece of bark with moss on it. Or, you know, like right now, all these harvesty items are so perfect. And it's also so much fun to add candles if you can handle it. <laughs> kids like to do this. They run their fingers back and forth through the candlelight and they all fight for a turn to put out the candle. So here's my brilliant, take it from me solution. One candle per child. Give them a few minutes by the timer to run their fingers through the flame. <laughs> if you can bear it, <laughs> let them play in the wax a little bit and then tell them to leave it lit and they each get to extinguish their own candle at the end of tea time, okay? That's my secret to handling candles. Or if that just drives you crazy to even think about it, Shh, don't tell them about the candles. <laughs> Do it without. All right. Poetry makes space for imagery and metaphor, for simile, for exploring themes and ideas without forcing your kids to sit down and work through some work pages. It happens almost accidentally. So one of the things that I want to do now is share with you about poems. I want to read poems, not just talk about it, because the power and the beauty of this experience is in the reading of poetry. So let's start. All right, I'm gonna go find my favorites. One of, the, one of the books that I absolutely love that is totally out of print is this one, The Read Aloud for Young People, Read Aloud Poems for Young People, edited by Gloria Hale, G-L-O-R-Y-A, H-A-L-E. I guess I'm dropping some knowledge on you, so you might need a pen and paper. Take a screenshot if you didn't already. Ready, set, go. Click, click, click. This book is available used, and I have seen it on Amazon. It can also be found in the library. There is no, there are no illustrations in this book, and there are books with illustrations, which I'm about to show you, but I think this is one of the finest compendiums of children's poetry, and partly because it's deliberately intended to be read aloud. One of the ways to start with poetry is you want to read funny poems. These are children. We're not trying to get them to read Lord Byron. We want them to be entertained. And fortunately, children's poetry is so fun. The name of this book, again, Read Aloud Poems for Young People, and Gloria, G-L-O-R-Y-A, Hale is the editor. So I like starting with the six silly rhymes and you can find these just by Googling. Here's an example of a silly rhyme. Way down south where bananas grow, a grasshopper stepped on an elephant's toe. The elephant said with tears in his eyes, hey, pick on somebody your own size. Here's another one. A horse and a flea and three blind mice sat on a curbstone shooting dice. The horse, he slipped and fell on the flea. The flea said, whoops, there's a horse on me. You see, these are silly, totally silly. But they, they rhyme and they have a nice beat and they're easy to memorize. And for kids who've never heard them, it's delicious fun. 
It's as yummy as Pop Rocks, you know? I always think poetry reminds me of Pop Rocks. It's like the words pop through your mouth. They're like crackling and clicking around under your teeth and through your tongue. And that's what makes reading poetry aloud so important. Here's a poem, all written in lowercase. I wonder if you can see it. Can you see it? It is called Maggie and Millie and Molly and May. And it is by the famous American poet E.E. E. Cummings, who just was not interested in capitalizing. It's not that he never did. It's that a lot of times he didn't. And one of the things that's fun for children to see is that punctuation serves the needs of the writer. It's not about accuracy. It's about communication. We want our children to understand that they are the master of their punctuation choices. So I'm going to read this one to you now. Maggie and Millie and Molly and May went down to the beach to play one day, and Maggie discovered a shell that sang so sweetly she couldn't remember her troubles. And Millie befriended a stranded star whose rays five languid fingers were, and Molly was chased by a horrible thing which raced sideways while blowing bubbles. And May came home with a smooth round stone as small as a world and as large as a loan. For whatever we lose, like a you or a me, it's always ourselves we find in the sea. Isn't that awesome? Johanna loved that poem as a child. She read it many, many times. And she writes poetry as an adult. Liam's favorite poem that he memorized back when he was in his I refuse to handwrite because of my dysgraphia phase. <laughs> He became a master memorizer and poetry was his favorite. And here it is, The Eagle by Alfred Lord Tennyson. He clasps the crag with crooked hands close to the sun in lonely lands. Ringed with the azure world he stands. The wrinkled sea beneath him crawls. He watches from his mountain walls and like a thunderbolt he falls. For years, Liam would just suddenly belt out, and like a thunderbolt, he falls. <laughs> you know, this little five-year-old voice, little six-year-old voice. He loved this poem. And in fact, Liam kept a stack of poetry books next to his bed so that when he couldn't fall asleep at night, he had something to read. Another great book for children that does have pictures and makes it easier for non-readers to pick a poem is this one. It's called Poems to Learn by Heart, and it is edited by Caroline Kennedy. Do some of you know this poem, poetry book? Take a screenshot, there you go. If you don't know how on the iPhone, I know you hit the home and the off button simultaneously. I don't know how to do it on Android. Yeah, this is a great book. And I just want you to get a feel for how gorgeous the illustrations are. Isn't that lovely? You can see, like that, that it's very easy for children to select a poem because they can just look at the images if they can't read. So this is a big time popular one. I'm going to find a poem from this one to read. I like this one and kids get a huge kick out of it. It's by Ogden Nash and it's very short. It's called The Parent. Children aren't happy with nothing to ignore. And that's what parents were created for. <laughs> now see, here's the thing I love about poetry. It speaks little known truths. It sneaks in and heals little breaches. Can you imagine if you're having a tough day with one of your kids and you spring this poem out for them to hear, to validate their feelings, to let them know that this experience they're having and that you're having is universal because that's what poems do. They put us in touch with our humanity and the universality of our cravings, our needs, our delights, our yearnings, our aspirations. This is a great one. Poems to Learn by Heart, Caroline Kennedy. Someone says, I look like I'm having fun. Are you kidding? This is my favorite thing ever. <laughs> you are so right because I love poetry. I really seriously do. Here's my favorite book, if you are an adult newbie, 
Maybe you don't like poetry yet, or you're afraid of poetry. How many of you are in that category? Just put a little number one in the comments real quick to make it easy. And show me that you grew up with a bad feeling about poetry. Some, you know, ghost of public school past made it horrible for you. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know why? They ruin it in school. They treat poetry a little bit like it's a frog to be dissected in the biology class, rather than what I like to say, a frog that is mysterious and jumpy to play with. Poetry is for fun. Poetry is for reflection. Poetry is for meditation. I use poetry as often to help me become a better person, to be perfectly honest, to connect with the souls and intentions of brilliant writers who have taken time to ponder the human condition and put it in sumptuous language. That's what poetry is. And I invite you back in. You're allowed back in the ring with poetry. You don't have to understand it. You don't have to master it or analyze it or dominate it or deconstruct it. You get to enjoy it. And you know how I know that you all already like poetry? Ha, ah, the lighting's changing from outside. Sorry about that. Because you love music. And music has song lyrics that are poems. You already know scads of songs, scads of poems. So read some that don't have music and allow the music to be the language itself, the rhythm, the mood. You know what? You also get to not like poems. You can read one and say, that's a head scratcher. I'm not interested. That one wasn't for me. And it could be the single greatest poem ever written, like, you know, The Wasteland. <laughs> you know, you don't have to like them. So you get to read them and have a reaction and allow yourself to be led into poetry. I'm going to read you now my favorite poem of all time. And you're not going to understand it necessarily. And I'm okay with that. This poem is by a Polish poet who lived through World War II. Her name, I have a hard time pronouncing, but I'm going to try. It is Wisława Zamborska. And she wrote in Polish, and this is a translation. So if there was a rhyme scheme, it's gone. But here's what I love about this poem, and this is why I'm sharing it with you mothers. I'm going to full disclose before I read it, so you'll get it, okay? I don't normally do this, but I want to make sure you're tuned in and you get it. The name of this poem is... Notes from a non-existent Himalayan expedition. Right, that sounds foreign. Notes from a non-existent Himalayan expedition. This poem is all about the yearning to be free of emotional pain and to live in the light of purity where nothing can cause you harm. It's all about not taking risk. It's about finding the method, the formula that ensures security and peace. Here's what she does. And can you imagine after World War II, who didn't want that feeling? Who didn't want to just leave the planet and be somewhere else, somewhere safe, somewhere pure? Okay, here's what she wrote. Seriously love this poem. So these are the Himalayas, mountains racing to the moon, the moment of their start recorded at the startling ripped canvas of the sky. Holes punched in a desert of clouds, thrust into nothing, echo, a white, mute, quiet. Yeti, down there we've got Wednesday, bread, and alphabets. Two, two times two is four. Roses are red there, and violets are blue. Yeti, crime is not all we're up to down there. Yeti, not every sentence there means death. We've inherited hope the gift of forgetting. You'll see how we give birth among the ruins. Yeti, we've got Shakespeare there. Yeti, we play solitaire and violin. At nightfall, we turn lights on, Yeti. Up here, it's neither moon nor earth. Tears freeze. Oh, Yeti, semi-moon man, turn back, think again. I called this to the Yeti inside four walls of avalanche stomping my feet for warmth on the everlasting snow. I love that poem. 
We've got Shakespeare, solitaire. Crime is not all we are up to down here. We have inherited hope, the gift of forgetting. I invite you to let go of the illusion of purity and high ideals and the anxiety and fear of the mistakes that you've made and be delighted again that we can turn on the lights in the darkness, that we can have alphabets and Wednesdays and bread. That's what this poem meant to me in my homeschool. I used to just remind myself, the meaning is here now. The alphabet, the tea time, the Shakespeare is here now. It's not for the future. It's not to fulfill somebody else's agenda. It's for now. I get to feel this now. I don't want frozen tears. I want the real kind. Americans' Favorite Poems, edited by the fabulous Robert Pinsky. Great book. Easy to find on Amazon at your local library. All right. Whew. What else do we want to read? Who knows Jane Kenyon? I know you're going to read a lot of poetry with your kids, so we're reading adult poetry because you're adults and I love you. Okay, this is an amazing poem. Jane Kenyon died of cancer, and she knew she was dying, and she wrote, oh, I'm trying. Let's see what we can do. Somebody's having telling me to change the glare. Let's see if this works better. Whoop. I'll do this for you. You will see my messy table behind me. Is that any better? Okay, hopefully. I will try this. All right, we'll try this. Thanks for telling me. So Jane Kenyon is an American poet who died because of horror of cancer and she knew it was coming so she wrote some of the most powerful poetry and what I love about her as a poet is that she doesn't shy away from acknowledging uh, the tension between those two so get ready because this is a tearjerker the name of this poem is otherwise I got out of bed on two strong legs it might have been otherwise I ate cereal sweet milk ripe, flawless peach. It might have been otherwise. I took the dog uphill to the birch wood. All morning I did the work I love. At noon I lay down with my mate. It might have been otherwise. We ate dinner together at a table with silver candlesticks. It might have been otherwise. I slept in a bed in a room with paintings on the walls and planned another day just like this day. But one day, I know it will be otherwise. Can you take that to heart as a homeschooler? You can. I'm already living in otherwise as relates to homeschool. I'm eating scones with you, not with my kids. Enjoy your kids, because someday it's going to be otherwise. Okay, let's quit crying. <laughs> let's go back to kid poetry. In 1967, 68, my grandfather bought me a poetry book, and I count this as the origin of my love for poetry. It's called You Read to Me and I'll Read to You. And honestly, I love this book, and it is a shred of a mess because I've used it so much. The author is John Ciardi, C-I-A-R-D-I. This poem book still exists. Here's what's fun about it. It's written in two colors. So one side is in blue and one side is in black. And one reader can pick all the blue poems and the other reader can pick all the black poems. My grandfather said to me, Julie, try this with Jim, my brother even with mother and daddy, also Aaron, who was a very small child at the time, picked this up while in New York and thinking about you, love, Papa. And this was June 7th, 1968. How treasured is that? So here's an example of a poem from this book and it's called, Wouldn't You? If I could go as high and low as the wind, as the wind, as the wind can blow, I'd go. Isn't that sweet? Short, lovely poems. Who knows Sharon Creech? Anyone know her? 
She's written two books, Love That Dog and Hate That Cat. I was told about this book actually by Brave Writer families who loved it so much. And I'm excited that we get to do an arrow for it, I think in January. Anyway, she has a great poem in here. It's all poems. Every single page is a poem. And this one I love. This is somebody trying to write a poem. I tried, can't do it, brain's empty. Can you imagine if you just gave your kids permission to write poems like that? Let's write about how we can't write a poem and see what it sounds like. Isn't that so fun? There's a second poem in here though that I wanna to read to you after I read the poem it's reacting to because I get a hoot out of it every time. Let me see if I can find it in here real quick. It's in my notes. Hold on, please. Okay, here it is. So do you all know the poem, The Red Wheelbarrow? So much depends upon a red wheelbarrow glazed with rainwater beside the white chickens. And here's what Sharon Creech in the character of this book wrote about it. I don't understand the poem about the red wheelbarrow and the white chickens and why so much depends upon them. If that is a poem about the red wheelbarrow and the white chickens, then any words can be a poem. You've just got to make short lines. <laughs> That's one of my favorites. So when we introduce our children to these writers and their ways of examining and reacting to language, we give our kids permission, don't we? To play with words, to tell their truths, to not be afraid to use language for the ways that make them feel connected to the world. We don't want everything to be this like educational, pristine idea. We want them to play. We want them to find poetry to be meaningful. I am unavoidably in these horrible glaring lights, so I'm just not gonna worry about it. But has anyone had tea lately? I need a sip. I also need a bite of scone. I invite you to take a bite of scone. Tell me who has kids watching. Say hello if you're a kid watching. We're just taking a tea break before I read more poems. Yay! Hello to children, put their names in and I'm gonna say hi to them. I definitely wanna do that. Liam and Elijah, hey, thanks for coming. So fun having you. An eight-year-old popped in. Hi, Ellie, great to have you. Hey, Violet, woohoo. Hi, River, Jackson, Michaela, hey, Matthew. What's up, Allison and Shelby, hey, Oliver. Uh, Monroe and Roosevelt, Kitty and Millie, Radley, Izzy and Mara, Arjun, Brandon, Zach and Ari, woohoo. Raise the roof. I love having you all here. This is awesome. Hey, Maggie Ray. So I'm Julie Bogart from Brave Writer, and I think about all of you every day. Hey, Toby, Sydney, and Grady, Mia, and Eli. Wow. You guys, thanks for coming and hanging out with me. I'm thrilled that you're here. Hey, Ellie and Ian. Oh, my goodness. That's a huge number of you all. Very good. Well, hi, Ryan. Okay, I'm gonna keep going because we're having fun. So here's what I wanna to talk to you about now. We've discussed how to read poetry just a little bit. We've talked about the books that you can use. You can get any at a library. In fact, go to the book section, right? And find it. Hey, Ed and Eden, Eden, who's six years old, yay. Go to the library, go to the book section that's all about poetry and just ransack the shelf. Every time you come home, bring home more people. You might try as a starter, Jack Prolutsky. I should write his name down, shouldn't I? I'm gonna see if I can. Woo, I don't have a pen. Jack Prolutsky, someone put it in the comments who knows him. P-R-E-L-U-T-S-K-Y, Prolutsky. He is hilarious, kids love his poems. Um, Shel Silverstein, longtime popular one as well, and then Young People's Poems series is fabulous. It will take each poet like uh, Rudyard Kipling or Robert Frost or Maya Angelou and devote a whole book just to their poem, but it is written with beautiful illustrations for children. Okay, so that's another one that you can use. Um, let me just think if there's any others. 
but there are so many old and um, new poems. There's like the Random House Anthology, which is very popular. I found with my kids that giving them the opportunity to select books is what made them the most interested in poetry. Um, yeah, uh, it's, I think it's called Poems for Young People is the name of that series. And you can find that in your library. Um, a librarian will know for sure. But those are wonderful. And then knock-knock jokes and riddles also count. It doesn't have to be strict poems. If you're trying to woo a damaged child back into poetry, start with humor. That's how we always begin. Um, one of my favorite books for writing poetry, for just thinking about poetry, is called Poem Crazy by Susan Wooldridge. And that's a fun book, especially for adults but and teens. Um, let's see. Yeah. I also really enjoy this book, but it's really for people who are all about poetry. It's, it's a little more sophisticated, but The Singing School is a fabulous book if you really get into poetry and you want to become like, hey, this is my little self-education as a mother. This is a good book. So, let's see. Awesome. Yeah, reading jokes and poems every morning is a great way to help with the grumpies. So here's what I haven't told you yet, and I should have told this at the beginning because we're losing people now, but that's okay because we've got the replay viewers and all of you who are still here, and I want you to know this. So we're doing a competition on Instagram tomorrow. If you have a poetry tea time with your kids, take a picture, post it to Instagram, and include the hashtag poetry tea time, okay? Hashtag poetry tea time. If you put that on your picture tomorrow, the next morning, Wednesday morning, my team and I are going to pick a winner and you will get the mini version of this teapot and the arrow poetry guide that Brave Writer puts out. And we will send that to you for free. But the only way you can get it is if you go on Instagram and post your picture, okay? So we would love to see it. We would love to see your family. I'm gonna move this again, hoping it's getting up. Oh, I'm really in the worst lighting. I don't know what happened. Ah! Um, so anyway, that's what you want to do. And of course, it doesn't have to be fancy. That's the beauty of this whole thing. You can have a poetry tea time in any way that you want to. But at the end of the day, there will be this long series of Instagram pictures under that hashtag, and we can all get to know each other and follow each other on Instagram and then inspire each other. Yes, exactly, that's why I'm doing it. I just think, I wanna know who's out there, and I want you to know who's out there who shares this enthusiasm. And then just so you know, we're working on something very special as a brand new thing that's gonna be a gift to the whole community around Poetry Tea Time, and we should have that ready to share in you know the next month. What I'd like to do, uh, because Periscope's so cool, is do a poetry tea time as a group, maybe once a month on Periscope. I'm also looking at Zoom. Um, there might be a way to do it as a group where we all like have a virtual tea party, which I think would be really fun. But mostly what I wanna give you the opportunity to do is to create tea times tomorrow. Tell your kids that they're in on this little challenge and then post your photo, hashtag it poetry tea time. We will find you and the winner will get a teapot and our poetry guide from Brave Writer, okay? So that's it. So now I wanna do just a little bit of housekeeping about Periscope and Brave Writer. And then I'm going to read a final poem by Seamus Haney, one of my other favorites, another, I'm sorry, tearjerker, but it's so beautiful. I have to read it and then we'll close, okay? So Wednesday on Periscope, I'm going to talk about Brave Writer just share with you products, answer any questions you have. Like somebody asked me, how is Brave Writer different or similar to IEW? We'll handle that on Wednesday. Uh, you wanna know how to use the Writer's Jungle? We'll handle that on Wednesday. You wonder what your kids should use who are nine and 11? We'll handle it Wednesday. So tune in if you want like the full coverage on what Brave Writer is. On Friday, we have to do our scope earlier. I'm gonna do it at 12 noon Eastern instead of four, here's why, good reason. My daughter, Katrin, at University of Pittsburgh invited me up for the weekend to watch her play rugby. Ah, she gets very muddy and very bruised, <laughs> but her game is early on Saturday morning. So I've gotta scoot out of here in the late afternoon on Friday to get to Pittsburgh in time to spend the night and get up early. So 
Periscope has to happen at noon. We will make sure we announce it in all of our usual spaces. But that Periscope will be about the Homeschool Alliance, my coaching program. And that is this one, the Julie Bogart, coachjuliebogart.com. I will show it to you. We'll look at it on my computer. I'll talk about all its features. And you can see if that's the kind of thing you want to be a part of. And then lastly, the last piece of business that I want to share is that we're discussing a gracious space and it's going to be in November. We will start on November 2nd. I'm taking November 1st off because I'll be in Pittsburgh hanging out with my daughter. I hope to periscope from her rugby game on Halloween. Wouldn't that just be awesome? I'll just like catch her for a few minutes. <laughs> so we'll do that on Saturday. But then on Monday, on November 2nd, we're going to start reading from this. And some people have sent me which essays they want to make sure I cover. If you're one of those people who loves to tell people what to do, here's your chance. Send me an email, julie at bravewriter.com, and tell me what to do. And then I'll do it, okay? You can buy this through amazon.com, or you can get it on my website. It's in the Brave Writer Lifestyle Tools in our store, okay? Whew, that was a lot. I'm exhausted. Any questions about poetry tea time before I make you cry? Any? This was super duper fun for me. I really love just the relaxed nature of this. No PowerPoints, just my favorite stuff. My favorite, favorite stuff. All right, I don't see any questions flying in. I'm assuming you don't have any. Okay, all right. One last sip of tea. My tea is getting cold. You are so welcome. I love doing this. Oh, I'm so glad. Oh, it's, we're just all having a blast. Did you realize that the 55 things I did wrong in homeschooling has 1,200 replay views in just a couple days? <laughs> like, wow, what I didn't do, all the things that make me cringe is popular. I didn't see that coming. Um, we are definitely going to do the 55 things I think I did right because I, it needs a balance. Um, so that's coming too. Oh my goodness, maybe tomorrow in fact. Oh, I'm glad you think so. Okay, let's find my other poem to read to you. You guys. So here's, in case you haven't picked up the thread of the poems I've shared with you today for the adults, for the adult members, it's to help you just remember the sacredness of this moment in your life. The here and now, the present, meaning for today, not meaning for the future, not fixing the past, but just for today. That's what today is. Poetry Tea Times can be any ages, all the way from baby up through adulthood. Absolutely. So what we're trying to do today is just remind ourselves that this is a privilege. Not everyone gets to do this homeschool thing. I mean, are you kidding? We wake up in our pajamas. We stay home. We eat fun foods. Our kids cuddle us and tell us they love us. They surprise us with all their antics. And that's what we call our work. I know some days it's just ridiculously hard, but you wouldn't keep doing it if the rewards didn't outweigh those challenges. And I know you know that. So today's just to remind you, we're pretty danged lucky, right? We're really lucky. Okay, this poem is by Seamus Haney, Irish. The Irish have the gift of the gab. Hello, I'm Irish. Did you ever figure that out? <laughs> yeah, they write great songs and great poems. All right, I, I hope to have inherited just, you know, an ounce of that genetic predisposition. So here we go. This poem is called Midterm Break. I'm warning you, I always cry. I sat all morning in the college sick bay, counting bells, knelling classes to a close. At two o'clock, our neighbors drove me home. In the porch, I met my father crying. He had always taken funerals in his stride and big Jim Evans saying it was a hard blow. The baby cooed and laughed and rocked the pram when I came in and I was embarrassed by old men standing up to shake my hand and tell me they were sorry for my trouble. Whispers informed strangers I was the eldest away at school as my mother held my hand in hers and coughed out angry tearless sighs. At 10 o'clock, the ambulance arrived with the corpse, staunched and bandaged by the nurses. 
Next morning, I went up into the room. Snowdrops and candles soothed the bedside. I saw him for the first time in six weeks. Paler now, wearing a poppy bruise on his left temple. He lay in the four-foot box as in his cot. No gaudy scars. The bumper knocked him clear. A four-foot box, a foot for every year. Poetry. It's sacred. Okay. So take on the challenge. Hashtag your, po your poetry tea times on Instagram. Jump in the pool, start swimming, and allow yourself to be carried away. Love you guys. I will see you tomorrow. I'm Julie Bogart from Brave Writer. Live honestly, write bravely. Have a great evening, you guys.